<clears throat> Thank you all for joining us for our first bibliophiles of the semester on this beautiful day. Uh, it's the busy start to the semester and we're returning to classes and campus and I wanted to express our gratitude for your joining us tonight. I'm Eric Inslee, the curator of rare books and maps here at UIowa Special Collections and Archives. And as curator of books, it is my privilege to welcome to Bibliophiles, for not the first time, Arthur Bonfield, a collector whose experience with and appreciation for early books through years of collecting makes him an asset to our Iowa community of Bibliophiles. Arthur has asked me to keep this brief, which I'll attempt to do. Uh, but his accomplishments are difficult to distill into a few bullet points. I'll do my best and will say that Arthur uh, is the ad Associate Dean Emeritus and Alan D. Vestal Chair Emeritus of the University of Iowa Law School, where he served in a variety of roles as professor for over 50 years and was a champion of civil liberties and rights in his scholarship and public service. He was Associate Dean and head of the Law Library from 1985 to 2014, where he greatly augmented the collections there. This is no surprise given that among Arthur's passions is the history of books, particularly those from early periods. The title of his talk tonight, The Why, How, What, and Result of Almost 65 Years of Rare Book Collecting, demonstrates that this was no hobby taken up recently. Arthur's collection is a monumental achievement showcasing volumes like the Nuremberg Chronicle and two copies of Hollandshed's Chronicles, books that aren't often found in private collections. Indeed, his collection touches on many subjects, chronicles, travels, encyclopedias, and even literature. But what is particular, uh, particularly fascinating about the collection is that the through line of thought that led from one subject to the next makes sense from both an academic and collecting standpoint. I look forward to hearing Arthur tell us about his practices and thoughts on his collection and collecting as an activity. Arthur, thank you for joining us and thank you and thank you for sharing your insights with us tonight. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. And um, uh, I wanna say that I spent the last 65 years, first as a law student, then as a law school professor. Uh, and during that time, uh, I wrote books, articles, reports for the government, statutes. Uh, I did all kinds of uh, law reform things. But during that whole period of time, uh, I had a not so secret, at least the members of my family certainly knew about it, avocation uh, that I pursued pretty relentlessly. This is the result of that avocation. That's my rare books library because I started collecting rare books about 65 years ago. Uh, and this library is the culmination of that collecting. Now, very early in my collecting, I realized that I needed an intellectual thread to join what it was that I was collecting, because I'll talk about specific subjects and so on later, but I had to have some kind of thread to consider how it was I should collect some things rather than others, and why a certain period, which I chose from 1480 to 1810. And I basically decided that I would like to see from contemporary materials, materials produced during the time, that time period, 1480 to 1810, I would like to see how European culture, knowledge, values, mentality, changed and evolved from medieval, which for these purposes I defined before 1500, to early modern European values, thought, knowledge, and points of view, which again, for this purpose, I define between 1500 and 1700. And then uh, into 
uh, the period of the Enlightenment, which again, for this purpose, I define starting roughly 1700 to 1810. Now, there are some factors about me as a human being, which you need to know, which may explain my persistence, my uh, dedication, my unwillingness to let go of my collecting. First, I grew up in a house full of books as a child. Thousands of books were in the child. Not rare books, but thousands of books. I was always a collector of things. I collected stamps and coins and fountain pens and so on. I'm compulsive. There's no doubt about that. And I cherish organization, symmetry, putting things together. I have also been always an extremely curious person. And since I was a child, I was very interested in reading about early explorers and voyages and early geography and European conceptions of all of those things. And lastly, a personal thing which explains something about what I ended up doing for the last 65 years as a persistent avocation. Finally, when I was about 10 years old, my parents, we lived in New York City, my parents took me to the Morgan Rare Books Library, which contained the library put together by J.P. Morgan in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I absolutely, as a 10-year-old, was gaga about that. It was unbelievable. I was so impressed. So I started collecting, and I will tell you in a while exactly how I started collecting. But the first thing I need to tell you is about some of the things I learned about books, their production, their sale uh, uh, during the period in, from which I collect, 1480 to 1810. Remember that printing was invented in the West, allegedly by Gutenberg, about 1450 to 1460. Printers during the whole period in which I collect, it's the hand printing, hand binding period. Printers literally took individual letters that were hand cast and put them together, inked them, uh, put a piece of handmade paper on top and a flat board, which is kind of eventually a, pre a press of some sort, printed the impression, hung it up to dry, turned it over and printed on the other side. Now, during that period, there were famous printers, and I've learned all about famous printers. And, fa and printers used to put what's called a colophon at the end and the last page of a book they printed. This, for example, I've always loved this, is the colophon for a printer that printed books in the 16th century by the name of Grafton. You should know that that barrel at the bottom is a ton. That was the English word for a barrel. And the tree on top is grafted to the ton. So this is Grafton's um, colophon. So you learn about printers, binding. Books were mostly sold unbound until the 18th century. You had your own binder that bound them. And English books particularly were bound in several types of leather, decorated in gold leaf or blind design stamping. They typically, English books had raised bands and a title on the spine like that uh, in different color leather. This happens to be 
Plutarch's Morals, published in 1603, that was bound by the bookbinder to Queen Elizabeth I in 1603. Uh, and we know that because I'll talk about Providence in a minute. I try to buy books with bindings that are in as good condition as possible. But if I buy a book where the binding needs some expert help, I have a expert, expert restorer, highly skilled, who returns the book to as close to the condition that it would have been at the time it was originally bound. Now, typefaces. This is Gothic type. It, it's English. This Gothic type was the type used on most books till almost about 1600. A few, occasionally after it happened, but mostly after 1600, it was Roman type. This is a 1525 print of Frossard's Chronicles. Next, the most important expensive thing in book publishing was the paper. The paper was hand bound, typically made from rags uh, and uh, very expensive. As a result, take a look at this page. This page comes from a book uh, called Nyhoff's Embassy from the East India Country to, the, to China in 1669. You will note that the picture at the top is upside down. It was a mistake. Paper is much too expensive to throw away paper. So they made a mistake when this came off the press, that is they flat put it down, they realized that they had, in this case, it's a copper engraving, but it, uh, until about 1600, it was mostly woodblock um, prints. Uh, they made a mistake, but they save it. And the next printing of this single page, since they printed page by page, it was corrected. Therefore, no two copies of the same book tend to be exactly the same because on the next page, they may have made another mistake of a different kind. They didn't throw that away. They changed it and so on. So books, uh, because they were handmade, paper was so expensive that books have errors in them. Okay. Next is the question of what is called provenance. Now, we are very interested in where books came from, not just because of the chain of ownership, but because of historical reasons that influence people. So you are looking at a book, it seizes commentaries, published in 1753, a very beautiful illustrated book. This was owned by the Macclesfield family, the Earl of Macclesfield. They sold in 2004 to 2006, 20,000 volumes at 12 Sotheby auctions for $20 million. These books were collected by the Earl's ancestors between 1679 and 1900. Why did they sell? Well, death duties in England, one. Two, inability to pay for all the expenses in a huge estate. And therefore, they frequently had to start selling off the books, the paintings, the furniture, uh, in order to be able to hold on to the estate. And the last thing they lost was the estate itself. But that's how these things came out. So provenance, those are two book labels from the Macclesfield collection. And I have six different titles that I bought from the Macclesfield collection library. 
Next, what we're interested in is the importance and desirability of annotations by contemporary readers, because those annotations give us some notion about the use of the book and the attitude of the people reading the book towards the book. This is an English history, Polydor Virgil, Virgil is the author, that was published in 1546. On every page of the book, you have annotations like you see on the screen and more, some full page, blank pages or uh, in the covers, full page written stuff. This was, the book is in Latin, and the Latin inscriptions were translated uh, by, um, uh, this was, uh, let's see, I think this was a Mag's book, uh, if I remember correctly, translated the annotations to see what they were saying. And the answer is, this book was being read in the years uh, 1552 to 1560, it was published in 1546 by, according to dates written in the same handwriting as all of this in the book as to when this was being done. It was written by an English Catholic reader objecting vociferously and with hostility to the English church reform that's being described in this book by Virgil. So uh, that's an interesting factor. Now, how do I acquire books? Well, first, rare book dealers. And the, most of the rare book dealers, the dealers who really have the kind of stuff I'm interested in between uh, 1480 uh, and, and 1810 are in London, Amsterdam, Paris, New York, rare book dealers, one place. Auctions, Sotheby has auctions. There are au several auctioneers in the United States, several auctioneers in Europe, uh, not only in London, uh, but also outside of London uh, and also on the continent in Amsterdam, in Paris and so on. Also, Internet catalogs, that's another place where you find books. Now, there are three printed guides that have helped me in, to some extent in figuring out or identifying books that I might be interested in. One, the most important, is a book called, it's a modern book. Printing and the Mind of Man by Carter, published in 1983, it lists and describes the most important books printed between the years 1450 and 1960 and influential in Western civilization. That's one book I use. A second book I use is Dibdin's Library Companion, published 1825. Dibdin wrote about the books collected by 18th and early 19th century English major collectors. He wrote about them, how rare they were or not rare, uh, or how important they were, and, and the copies that he was aware of. The third thing I frequently consult is a reference guide to literature of travel by a man by the name of Cox, three volumes, 1935. Now, how do I ascertain price? How do I ascertain whether a book uh, is being sold at a fair price? Well, first, of course, I check dealers' websites and catalogs. Second, I check American Book Prices Current, which is online and lists auction prices by title and author of, uh, of books going all the way back. Three, 
Rare Book Hub, which is also online, also contains auction records for rare books. Four, there is an internet thing that you can buy books from via Libre. It's an internet site where dealers from all over the world offer books. And finally, fourth, the rarity and comparables, because that's something that my experience over collecting for 65 years has helped me develop. Now, after I do purchase books, they're sent overnight by FedEx to me, tracked, and it's overnight from London, Amsterdam, Paris, New York, fully insured by the dealer. I only buy from reputable dealers, and over the years, I've developed relationships with them, and they're the deal kind of dealers. If I don't like the book, even after they've sent me 30 pictures, if I haven't physically seen it, even if they send me pictures and detailed descriptions of condition, send it back and there's immediate uh, uh, re return of my money. So that's not a problem if I deal with these kind of reputable dealers. Uh, now, um, I do research before I buy and after I buy. One of the first things I do when I'm thinking about a book is I check scholarly books about the book I'm thinking about acquiring. Current scholarly books, books printed uh, in the 19th and 20th, 20th and 21st century, uh, modern scholarly treatments to see how important this book is and why I should or should not be interested in it. Secondly, I also check online the number and location of copies of the book that are in the major uh, rare book libraries and rare book collections in the United States uh, and abroad, because you can go and actually see their catalogs online. Now, in addition, I keep a detailed catalog of my collection. I have 16 large uh, loose leaf volumes for each title in my collection. And there are about 500 different titles, uh, about a thousand volumes. For each title in my collection, I have a transparent envelope into which I put the dealer's description of the book, the scholarly information about the book, the purchase documents for the book, known later sales of the book, and any preservation done by my rare book uh, expert on the book, if any. I try to get them, they don't need it, but it might. Now, in collecting, over the years, um, I have to have date limits. Otherwise, there's no, it's, it's endless. So my dates are 1480 to 1810. And I won't go out of those uh, dates because otherwise I'm all over the place. On a few occasions, I must admit I have, but nevertheless, I don't and I try not to. Secondly, the most important factor in purchasing is my uh, is my or the relationship uh, to my general intellectual thought about the collection that it must illuminate European changes in thought, culture, knowledge, and values from medieval times to early modern times to the Enlightenment time. Now, in buying, I admit. Aesthetics do attract me, but content is number one, but also curiosity attracts me. I have no doubt, and it's clear in the nature of my collection, that I have a preference for folios, and most of my books are folios. Folios are large books where the original sheet of paper from which it came, handmade paper, is only folded once. A quarto 
it's folded twice. In other words, the, that four, you end up with four. So uh, I like folios. I like illustrated books with maps and, and, the, and the engravings, woodblock or, or copper engravings, and beautifully bound books. Of course, I sometimes just stumble on a book that I just like and buy it, particularly when I go to a rare book dealer in person and look at his stock and then see the books uh, right there uh, where I may find something I wasn't looking for or go to the New York Antiquarian Book Fair or on occasion once went to the London Book Fair. Now, of course, the longer I collected, the more expensive the books I acquired became because the things I wanted became rarer and rarer and more expensive to kind. However, there's one fact about me which you've got to understand. Once I decide there's a certain book I want, I never give up. And when I say I never give up, I have looked for a particular book title date for 10 years or more until I was able to find it. Uh, uh, and um, when I finally did, I then bought it as quickly as I could. Occasionally, I had to wait because the price was such that I had to wait a little bit. But I bought it, and I, and I kept on searching until I found it. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about how I started collecting. In 1957, I was a first year law student at Yale Law School. And that one afternoon, uh, I went out uh, and the law school is only two or three blocks from an area where there were some stores. Uh, and I noticed that a man was opening up a second-hand bookstore. And I looked in the window and he had books piled on the floor, like about stacks of them, like five feet tall, all over the floor. There were shelves along the walls and he was starting to put books in the shelves. So the door was unlocked, I opened the door, walked in, and um, started looking around. He said, welcome, look around, but I'm not quite ready yet, as you can see. I said, okay. So I looked around, and I saw a pile of books. They were, as I say, five feet high, probably, book upon book upon book. The bottom book was this big leather-bound what I now know and to call as a folio. At the bottom of this pile, the other books were not old books. They were books published during the 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s of the, uh, of the 19, 1900s. So I looked at this book down there and I said to him, sir, would you mind if I moved these books off? I'd like to take a look at the book at the bottom. He said, go ahead. You know, this is going to be a business. I'm, I'm in business here. So I moved the books off and I take this book out. Now, I picked up this book. I'd never seen a book like this. It was bound in leather, raised bands. You're looking at the spine of the book. It said on the back, on the spine, Camden's Britannia. I opened the book up to the title page and it said 1695 with a big engraved title page. Oh man, what is this? Now, I had always loved books, but it was books, you know, published in the last, at that time, 57, probably in the last, 30, 40 years. Yeah, that's this. I've been secondhand bookstores. So I flipped in the book. Oh, look at this. A two-page map of a county. Oh, flip some more. Another two-page map of a county. 
And I kept on flipping through. And it turns out it's got a map of every Eng each and every English county in a two-page fold-out map. And then it's got pages showing Roman coins that were found and some ruins in English parts of England and so on. Oh, in a secondhand bookstore, you've all been in one probably. You look at the beginning of the book because they usually in pencil put in how much the book costs. I looked, there was nothing there. Sir, I said, sir, this is an interesting book. Uh, how much is it? Now, he was standing no more than 15 feet from me. His response was, that's a big book. Uh, yeah, it is. Leather bound? Yeah, yeah. $10. $10? I bought it. I bought it, left the bookstore, went immediately to what was called the Sterling Library at Yale. That was before the rare book library, Beinecke, was built. And I went in the side entrance, which is right around off the law school, which is where their rare books were, and got a librarian. I said, could you please help me? Look at this, what I got. Where did you get that? They wanted to know. I opened up, oh, you know, that's a famous and important book. That's a famous and important book. That's Gibson's edition of Britannia. That's a very famous and important book. Where did you get it? I got it at that bookstore he's opening up. Really, how much did you pay? $10. He'll be bankrupt shortly. He doesn't know what he's doing. So that's the first book I got. So I love that book. About two, two months later, maybe, I went back to the same bookstore. This time, he had another old book. They were really the only ones he had that was that old that was in the store. The binding you're looking at now on this, Harris's Voyages, was not the binding. My restorer did that. The binding was bad, but the book was complete. It's filled full of dozens of maps and copper engravings. They're two large folio volumes of voyages, travels, and explorations from 1744. I bought that for only a little more than I paid for the Camden, but its binding was not in great condition. So I had bought a voyages and travels book and a geography book in 1957 and maybe the beginning of 58, First one was 57, maybe the beginning of 58. And that's where I was. So I decided that I was going to collect voyages, travels, and explorations, and geographies. Why? One, I knew that scholars claim that the publication of books on these particular subjects European voyages, travels, and explorations, and geographies of the time had an enormous contemporary impact on European thinking during the whole period I was thinking of. Remember, 1580 is before Columbus. Starting with Columbus, wow, all their preconceptions were blown up in the air as they read these voyages and travels about people. And the geographies also talking about parts of the world they didn't know existed. So I decided I was gonna collect these two subjects and go back and collect from that period. However, I will tell you, and my talk will demonstrate that over time, the specific subjects I collected migrated from one to another that were consistent with my overall intellectual notion of what I was collecting. That is, 
I stuck to the dates, 14, uh, 1480 to 1810. And the overall theme of the collection, the changing knowledge, values, conceptions, and ideas from late medieval to uh, early modern to the Enlightenment, I stuck with those. But I started with European voyages, travels, expeditions, then and geographies. But then over time, I moved to collecting from that period only annals, chronicles, and histories, general encyclopedias and dictionaries of the arts and sciences, political philosophy, um, English translations of classical Greek and Roman literature, some science, uh, and, and some other things like that. Now, one more thing before I go in to shine to give you some examples. Most of the books that I ended up collecting were English, but not all. I collected some Dutch books, French books, Spanish books, Italian books. In languages, they were mostly in English, but also Latin, lots of books in Latin, because remember learned people learn and read Latin well into uh, the uh, early 1700s, certainly through the 1600s, 14, 15, 16, mostly Latin if you were educated. But there were also more and more the vernacular languages came in. So languages, mostly English, also Latin, French, Dutch, Italian, Spanish. I try to acquire only complete copies. Of course, if there's binding work that has to be done, uh, when it has to be done, I have my rare book restorer do that. Now, what I'm going to follow for the rest of the talk, I'm going to follow with a few examples. It's only a few, since I've got hundreds and hundreds of titles and a thousand uh, volumes, um, I can only give you a few samples, but I'm going to show you how one book leads to another book, and one subject of books that I collect, consistent with my theme about showing how thinking in Europe evolved and knowledge in Europe evolved, one subject leads to another subject. So, let me start out with voyages, travels, and explorations after Harris. Harris was that first one I showed you that I bought in New Haven. Uh, I had to wait a while. Actually, it was until uh, about 1980 before I could buy these two books. There's, th th this is one edition, and I have both editions. Hacklet, H-A-K-L-U-Y-T. He was an Englishman that lived during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. That's the last uh, third uh, of uh, the 16th century. So Hacklet published a collection, first edition um, uh, of Hacklet, was uh, in 1589, and the second edition, 1599 to 1600. This is the second edition on the screen. I also have the first edition. He published this collection of English voyages and explorations it, with a purpose. He wanted to convince Queen Elizabeth and the English people that they should have an overseas empire and colonies because it would make them rich the way Spain was. And he published these voyages that were earlier voyages by the English to prove that the English had made discoveries of new lands and that entitled them to these places they discovered and explored, just like the Spaniards claimed title to the places they discovered and explored. 
So I got these two editions. And next, it took me 10 years of searching before I could find a set of purchase. Purchase contained the unpublished Hacklett materials that Hacklett had not published by the time he died. Purchase was published in 1625. It's in English and it contains the largest collection of voyage narratives published up to that time anywhere. It contained hundreds of additional half page maps, but most importantly, it contained four folding two page maps. One, the Briggs North America map shows California as an island, which led the people of Europe to think California was an island until almost 1700. Two, John Smith's original map of Virginia. Remember Pocahontas? Three, a 1624 map of New England, which was at the time the Pilgrims landed, 1620. Pilgrims landed 1620. And also a very early map of China, 1620. This is a very important collection. Um, and it was very difficult to come by. Not only uh, did it take me 10 years to find it, but I had to wait a while before I managed to collect the Luca to get it. That led me next to Onsham Churchill, who was Winston Churchill's great, great, great grandfather, I believe, maybe one more great. This is an English collection of voyages, travels, and certain discoveries uh, from accounts from explorers all over the world, all over the world, with hundreds of maps, copper engravings of what they allegedly saw, and so on. I continued to pursue, after this and the others, and add all the English collections of voyages, travels, until I almost, my collection almost contains every one of them. Collections of voyage and travels for the period that I'm talking about, which is the period up till 1810. My research then led me to understand that while I was focusing on English collections of voyages, travels, and explorations, that there were important and great foreign collections. So I began to do research and try to explore them. So I came upon Ramuzio's collection of voyages 16, 1563, as you see. And these volumes are written in Italian. They're one of the earliest published attempts to create a comprehensive collection of narratives of European voyages. Notice, this was published before Hacklett. Hacklett was in 1589. And of course, before purchase, which was in 1625. So I got this collection. It was written in Italian, which is unusual. It was published in Italy. You would have thought it would be published in Latin. That was the language of learned people. But nevertheless, they published it in the vernacular language. And this is unusual. This also contains many early maps. So. After that, I discovered what is the most rare of all, series of books published in the period 1590s to early 1600s about travel narratives, voyage narratives, 
a man by the name of V. Bry in Frankfurt, what is now Frankfurt, German, Frankfurt, he started publishing slim volumes, folio volumes, listing in Latin a description of the voyage of some voyager to the New World uh, and containing anywhere from 22 to 40 full page copper engravings depicting scenes of voyages and observations and what they saw. The De Bry volumes were published in Latin and also in German. They are highly illustrated. They are the most illustrated travel narratives that, that have existed up to that point and up to even a period of another 25 or 50 years after that. And I should tell you, they started to be collected by European collectors in the 1700s. They were published in the 1590s, but they were already being collected by European collectors in the 1700s. The one you've got in front of you uh, is Brazil. And this one talked about, and there are pictures in it of cannibalism of certain Brazilian tribes and explaining Stodden's experience and Leary's experience in Brazil, describing the cannibalism and then with pictures to illustrate it. I have uh, five different De Bry's published in this period. Next, a massive, massive uh, Dutch collection of Portuguese, Spanish, English, and other nations, voyages, travels, explorations, with hundreds of illustrations and maps published in 1706 in Dutch by Van der Rohe. So all these things, one led me into another. That's what constantly was happening. And this is just a sample of the Voyage and Travels book that did that. Now, on the other hand, the same thing happened with geography. Okay, so I go, to the New York Antiquarian Affair one year. And I noticed that this dealer from England has got this book, Munster's Cosmography Universalist 1554 in Latin. It's a folio. I look, look through it. Not only does it have maps, but it has all kinds of other things in there, descriptions, pictures, and so on. Uh, and I decided to buy it because after all, I had had a few earlier geographies and, and Camden was a geography of England. So I got this book, brought it home after he sent it to me. I mean, I had had it at home and started doing research about it. I discovered through my research that in the, this period, the 16th century, there were two schools of geography, a mathematical school and a descriptive school. The mathematical school came from Ptolemy, an ancient Greek geographer, and the descriptive school came from Strabo, an ancient Greek philosopher. So, so, what I did is start searching. Munster had translated from the original Greek a copy of Ptolemy. Ptolemy did a mathematical approach to geography in AD 110 to 168. It was done in Latin, 
uh, and uh, Munster trans uh, translated it from Greek into Latin. And so I bought, searched for, and bought this 1552 copy of the mathematical approach to geography by Ptolemy, published in 1552. Then I kept on looking for Strabo, his descriptive theory of geography, published originally put together in 63 BC to 25 AD. I found a copy published in 1523, Strabo edition, translated from Greek uh, by a man by the name of Typhernus. So I got that. While I was doing this research, I stumbled across, oh, that's the Strabo. That's the Strabo. I stumbled across, uh, wait a minute, what am I doing? Strabo? Okay. Uh, I st stumbled across a man by the name of John Ogilvy. He was, and I stumbled across his name and one of his books while I was collecting the, uh, the uh, first three books I just showed you. Uh, I became interested in this guy. He was an Englishman who in the 1670s published a series of geographies of the continents of the world and certain countries that he translated from earlier Dutch geographies into English. So I searched for and found a copy of Africa, which is one of his geographies. And I decided I would collect all of his geographies because they were beautifully illustrated with maps uh, and copper engravings and descriptions, geographic descriptions of the area and the culture of each place covered. So I decided to collect all of his publications and I uh, 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 bought Africa, Asia, different book, China, different book, Japan, different book, America, different book, and Britain. All of those were published between 1669 and 1675. Highly illustrated, many maps and plates, and I got those. Well, when I read, however, all about Ogilvy and his printing and publishing and realized that he had translated the books that he published in English from Dutch books and made some changes in some editions, but mostly they were just uh, plagiarized. I said, oh, I really better take a look into those Dutch geographies. So I acquired all of the Dutch geographies um, originally written in Dutch, and as these books are all in Dutch, by Dapper, Nijhoff, and Montanus. And Ogilby translated the ones he did from these books. And these books contain other geographies that Ogilby did not translate into English that are in Dutch and in this collection of Dutch geographies. Finally, geography led me inevitably into history. Because look, I had the voyages, travels, and so on. I had the geographies. I was trying to understand the change in values, knowledge, um, thoughts, uh, culture in Europe from medieval to, to uh, early modern, to enlightenment, I had to know how these books fit into those periods. So I had to know something about the periods. So I acquired a copy of this world history by Schadel. It's the Nuremberg Chronicle, 1493. It describes medieval thinking and knowledge. It's a history of the world following the Bible. And then at the end, a little bit of what we would call modern history. It's written in Latin. 
It contains 1,809 woodcuts uh, it, uh, and illustrations. It's pigskin over wooden board binding. And as you will see, it's got a map of the world without the new world. Why? They started putting together the printing of this book before Columbus left, and they just finished the printing when Columbus had just come back and they didn't know it. And so you have a map of the world here without uh, the North America, South America, and the Caribbean. And in the left hand on the column, so that you understand about medieval thinking and knowledge, you've got things they supposed they would see if they traveled to unknown lands, none of which, of course, exist. So after that, I, after reading about that, I, was, I read about the polychronium, chronicon, Higdon and Trevista's translation, 1527, another history of the world. This is one of the earliest two-color hand-printed English title pages, 1527. Very, very good. And the copy that I've got is in beautiful condition. Next, because most of my books were English, I had to focus more on English early history. Here's Frosart's Chronicles, 1525. This is the history of the Hundred Years' War between England and France. This covers the period 1350 to 1400. This is the first English edition, transfer, translated 1525, printed by, by Bernier. Then that led me to, oh, people kept on telling me, oh, you know what you've got to have? And then I started researching it. You've got to have Hollingshed's Chronicles. And there we go. Hollingshed's Chronicles, 1577, first edition, 1587, second edition. Hollingshed's Chronicles were the largest and most comprehensive and detailed English history collection up to this time. The first edition, that's on, the, uh, the, uh, that's on your left as you looked at the picture, was illustrated. The second edition, and there are two copies of it to the right, are not illustrated. However, why do I have two copies? The copy in the center is what is called a castrated copy. Queen Elizabeth and the Privy Council did not like some of the things it said. So they required for its sale the cutting out of certain pages. And that was done. And this copy doesn't have them. The copy on the right in 1700, somehow an uncastrated copy got through, a printers reprinted the castrated removed pages and reinserted them in the copy on the right. And finally, uh, I bought these Hall's histories, which Shakespeare also used. Shakespeare used Hollingshed for all his history plays and for Macbeth and King Lear. And similarly, Hall's was used for his history plays. Uh, also, uh, as a model, you might say he plagiarized a bit. He did, but that was common at the time. Now, given the time, I'm not going to be able to go much more. Um, I thought I'd be able to kind of, I should go through very quickly, though, uh, encyclopedias. I started out, here's Pliny's. Natural History, 1483. Uh, that's an ancient civilization encyclopedia done by a Roman uh, in the period 77 to 79 AD. This is another incunabulum encyclopedia, 1491, done during the Middle Ages. This is a bridge between the Middle Ages and the start of early modern, Reich's Philosophica. Uh, and this was, in fact, uh, a textbook used by university students in those days. And this is the beginning of the Enlightenment, 
French Bale, uh, uh, Dictionary of the Arts and Sciences. And Bale uh, is very important because uh, one, he advocated toleration and two observed that much of what was considered truth was only opinion. And then you start the beginning of the English encyclopedias. And I think I'm gonna stop here with one comment because I showed you a scan of a few encyclopedias, one led to another. The, uh, I was told by a dealer that rare book libraries, including the best, did not have all editions of early English alphabetical uh, and general encyclopedias because the users at the time read them frequently like textbooks. If you were in school, they'd all go read the same thing. So they were destroyed. Well, I then went and checked online the major rare book collections and found out that what he said was true. Very few collections had more than a smattering of the 18th century English encyclopedias. I then decided 40 years ago that I would collect all of them. And I have all of the English encyclopedias from alphabetic uh, and general from Harris 1704 all the way through till 1810. I own them all. Uh, and they're in my collection. And also, here's a copy of Diderot's Encyclopedia, which of course is French, which started out just copying Chambers, the English, but they went from the two volume Chambers into the 35 that. Well, let me conclude this way. Let me go uh, to the end and just say, um, that look, so I've ended up with about 500 different titles of books published and printed during this period, about a thousand volumes, most of them folio. Content and contemporary importance of content was the key for me. And in preference for important books with illustrations, maps, nice bindings, enormous satisfaction, great intellectual awards I got, or rewards I got, from understanding how European civilization changed during this period of 400 years almost, uh, how, how European ch changed from contemporary materials and also learned about printing. I'll take questions now. Uh, there was more, uh, I wasn't able to do it all, but that's how the cookie crumbles. <laughs>